What's going on guys, Carmine here, and welcome to my Game of Thrones Season 7 Episode 1 review. I just got done watching the episode a second time, and I've got to say, they definitely delivered. It's a shame that they only do so when there's just 7 episodes left this season, but it was a pretty good premiere. A lot better than the Season 6 premiere, which kind of felt like deleted scenes from the Season 5 finale. This one felt more like a brand new season, and it shows. The trick to a season premiere of Thrones is always figuring out how many days, weeks, or months it's been since the last season finale, but it seems here that it's either been a couple of days or maybe even 48 hours. Regardless, the premiere hit most of my wish list, which includes Northern Politics, Greyjoy appearances, and a fantastic opening. Let's get to it. And before we begin, I just want to give a big shout out to the Game of Thrones Amino app for sponsoring this video. For the past week, they had a prediction challenge where some of their users could win prizes simply by predicting what's going to happen. And this year, they'll have lots more for you to do. For those of you who don't know, the Thrones Amino app is a great platform for fans of the Game of Thrones series to connect with other fans, share some theory ideas, and even interact with other Game of Thrones content creators. I've been active on there since the app launched, and it's a great place for me to get all the latest news on the series, check out some of the cool fan art, and even connect with some of you guys. It's available for both Android and iPhone, so definitely consider checking it out and following me on there, and don't forget to send me a baba booey when you do, because I'll be on there all season sharing my own predictions and catching up on the latest theories and ideas. I'll leave a link in the description below. I'll see you on there. First, let's start with the Riverland scenes, and my god, that opening was fantastic. I did hear rumors that Arya would be getting revenge on House Frey this season, but I didn't think it would be that badass. I feel bad for any of the cooks or serving people in the back who managed to get a taste of that wine before she served it to the other Frey members. I've also got to give it to David Briley. I gotta give him one final applause for his last performance here. He made sure to try and act as shady as possible with certain movements of his face and mannerisms to make it look more authentic that Arya was there, you know? And because of his brilliant performance, the showrunners decided to open episode 1 with this scene. He definitely knocked it out of the park there. I also love watching Arya tell one of the Walder's wives that the North remembers. And this is something I actually predicted many years ago would happen, and many of my subscribers back then brushed it off. Understandably so, with how the books were going at the time and how little our main characters ever managed to get their personal revenges out there. But she did, and it was great. I will admit though, I don't really want to see Arya in the Riverlands so much this season because we've gotten it so much for almost one third of her character history, but watching the next episode preview, it does seem like she will still be in the Riverlands, kinda, and we know her destination is King's Landing so she can take Cersei out once and for all. I will admit I was completely okay with the random scene of her drinking with the Lannister soldiers. It does answer nitpicky questions about what happens to the area when the lords have all died. The crown sends in troops to keep the peace, but honestly, I don't know, it, it was, it was, it was alright. That weird cameo didn't get in the way too much, but once again, I hope this doesn't become too much of a habit this season where she just stays in one place. Arya scenes this episode open great and ended on a good note. My one hope is that I'd like to her I like to see her continue traveling and maybe even use her travels as a way for the audience to see what's been happening in the countryside since she was there originally in season four. As for the Hound and the Brotherhood, well let me just say that very few characters have that Bronn and Tyrion effect. That is, when they're partnered up with certain people, their characters shine and allows for great moments any show could use. The Hound now joins those ranks, and watching him go back and forth with Beric and Thoros was great, and so was that top notch joke. I didn't like how they kind of snuck the Hound in for an episode or two last season just to coin him back into the story, but in hindsight, it was a good decision. His character development this episode was welcomed, and his potential grows even more for this season. My one concern is on Beric and Thoros holding any scene without the Hound. Can they do it? I don't think so, which is completely fine. Some characters, despite being very interesting, also serve to complement and help others deliver. Beric and Thoros are great for this, but as someone who is curious with the Lord of Light's religion, I want to see more secret stories and fights from these two who practice it. But the Riverland scenes overall were great, and this time around, it was not bad. But let's see what some of you had to say. Zombie Slayer says, The only scene I really hated was the Ed Sheeran one. I think I said, by the way, his name right. Uh, that was so goddamn unnecessary and stupid how they just cast him in there for no reason. I understand where you're coming from, but they've had musicians on before, but usually in a low-key way. Sometimes as actual musicians or on occasion just standing there in the background. I would have had an issue with it if they made him the main character in that little discussion, but they didn't. It went on to the guy with the long black hair. It's also nice to see that not all Lannister soldiers are jerks who rape and torture. And the song he was singing had a good significance to it, which we'll cover later on. 
Aeon said, Arya is too overpowered and her scenes are just cheesy. I mean, how can a little girl kill grown men so easily, and how the fuck did she pass as Walder Frey? I get the mask and all, but wouldn't anyone have noticed that poor old Walder Frey just got 40 centimeters shorter and smaller than he was before? This was a complaint of mine in the previous video, but if you really want to argue this, she could be tippy-toeing or maybe even standing on a box or something. Keep in mind that a lot of these characters wear long robes and she could hide something on her feet, so there you go. But I do agree with you with the height thing, especially if Walder had to l walk like through the halls. As for her being overpowered, it was the house in black and white training. Some of it during a montage and some of it off screen. Faceless men are usually very OP, which is why we rarely see them, but Arya isn't as OP because she quit her training halfway. So I guess that balances itself out. Now let's get on to Sam in the Citadel. I'm glad we're getting him doing something useful and actually going out of his way to gather information. With just seven episodes left, they're wasting no time making Sam useful. His scenes this episode were funny, insightful, and a little interesting, but I've gotta say, fuck you to the showrunners for that montage of him changing bedpans. Seriously, I, I actually ordered a pizza beforehand so I could eat it while watching this episode, and that part really ruined my appetite. Let me know if you guys had a similar experience, but I'm really happy we got less of Gilly this episode and more of Sam doing his thing. The one thing I will admit I didn't like is the whole Jorah suddenly popping up. Yeah, he had a nice presence, but I feel like the showrunners are reaching here with this whole reunion thing and how everyone needs to converge on Westeros. But I would have liked for Jorah to have stayed in Essos and ventured towards Ashai. For those of you who don't know, Ashai is where many of the Lord of Light followers hail from, including Melisandre and it's a place of mystery and arcane learning. I would have loved to have seen it, and Jorah's grayscale would have been a perfect excuse for us to go there. But the Sam scenes, overall, not bad, funny in some places, but it did its job. However, you guys had different thoughts on the matter. On Facebook, Rowan wrote to me and said, I hated how Sam isn't a maester yet, and yes, I'm impatient, but I want him to get some cool stuff done. All they have him doing is cleaning up after people, and now they're replacing Gilly with shit-covered buckets? Showrunners really do have a sick sense of humor. Also, did you notice the dagger in Sam's book? Thoughts on that? I don't know, Rowan. I, I, I don't really don't think the showrunners intended to substitute Gilly for buckets of shit, but I see your point. However, at the same time, it's only been like, what, 48 to 72 hours since the finale of season 6? It's not clear yet. I didn't expect him to be a maester so soon, but we have to remember Sam's first obligation, being at the Citadel, is to help Jon win the war against the White Walkers, and I'm glad they're not wasting any time in doing that. And yeah, I did see the dagger used in Bran's assassination attempt. I would know, I have its replica. And it's really weird because the dagger pops up a bit more in the books, whereas in the show, it doesn't. The last person who had it was Kathleen, and we don't know what happened to her belongings. Hopefully, it pops up again. On Twitter, Pound Little Bows said, The Sam and Gilly scenes are not long enough. We need a ninth season focused on Sam, Gilly, and the baby. Oh, I get it. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a good joke. <sighs> <laughs> now let's focus on King's Landing. I will say that I was dreading the whole Lannister Greyjoy alliance, but you know what? It kind of grew on me. The whole thing was cliche from the beginning, but it was actually pretty cool. The whole conversation between Euron, Cersei, and Jaime was pretty fun, and also got some more of my favorite things. Backstory and history. Euron's character here differs slightly from his book counterpart, and so does Jaime. If I recall correctly, the book doesn't say that Jaime was at the Greyjoy Rebellion, but the show version, he was one of the first ones in the fighting, along with Jorah Mormont and Thoros of Myr. As for Euron himself, he's just... Kind of a douchier version of Ramsay, who has a fetish for ships instead of one for flaying. I will admit though, Euron won me over when he roasted Jamie. That was good, but he still has to win the audience over. In the books, Euron is unpredictable, insane, and charismatic. Kind of like an evil James Bond. But in the show, well, he still has to show us more. In total, Euron has had less than 40 minutes of screen time, if you can believe that. And as of last night, it's still up in the air if he'll be able to mesh with other characters in a good way. As for Jamie and Cersei's whole relationship, it appears to be a little rocky, but I admire and hate that Jamie is still standing by her. I admire it because it takes balls to stay that committed to someone so up her own ass, and I hate it because I want Jamie to be happy. I like the guy, he's come a long way from pushing kids out windows, but at this rate, it'll end badly for him. Cersei, on the other hand, is exactly who we thought she'd be on the Iron Throne, calculating and cold. I understand her not mourning the death of Tommen, she is one of those people who mourn in their own way. I get it, I'm like that too, but I gotta say, Cersei's one true 
redeeming factor was her love for her kids, and now that they're out of the picture, it'll be weird for the audience to sympathize with her this season. Yeah, she slaughtered many people in that attack last season, but the mindset was clear. Do it for the family. Her moving on so quickly is a little sad, but also understandable. My one complaint is that we didn't get a follow-up on the Faith. Not all of them are dead, so I would have loved the montage of Cersei having them killed or something over Sam's ship bucket montage. I would have also liked for them to acknowledge their kids a bit more than how they did. Jaime has never really been a father to them, so this would have been a good moment for him to shine in that way, so I feel like it's a missed opportunity. But I did enjoy King's Landing this episode, but let's see what you guys thought. From Patreon, Darren says, So are we getting the Valonqar prophecy with Cersei or not? Nah? I don't think so. In the books, Jaime and Cersei's relationship is a bit more grounded. Ever since Jaime's return to King's Landing after spending time with Brienne, he and Cersei have been on the rocks, and he flat out ignores her at some points. Personally, I believe the Valonqar is Jaime. It's more poetic for him to kill her, just like he did the Mad King and for the same reason. But keep in mind that prophecy is a big thing in the books, but not so much the show. It's been sidelined and occasionally mentioned here and there, but that's about it. I doubt we'll get any Valonqar type death for her that the book has envisioned. This is bad news for book readers who want it, and good news for the show because it leaves many possibilities of how she could go down. By Dragon or Arya. Who knows. And Super Nadine says, Why is no one talking about Euron? He looks like a complete psycho, much more so than in Season 6. And that was some great acting in my humble opinion. All that smiling and hand gestures? Creepy. I've got to agree. Once again, it's a shame that he didn't get much screen time last season. I was looking forward to him coming on, but all it did was tease us for his potential. I'm glad this episode gave us enough of him to keep wanting more, and the actor did do a good job. I just hope to god they don't fuck him up and actually give him cool things to do. Some people complain that he is too cartoonish, but I've got to disagree. He is almost Heath Ledger's Joker here in, this, in his scenes, and I like that. But hopefully it's not too obnoxious later on. He is a badass with a big cock and fleet. We get it. Now do something cool. Over at Dragonstone, Danny's fleet has arrived and well, there's not much to say. I really loved her this episode, but I don't know if it's because she barely had any lines or because she's finally fucking landed. My god, it's been a while. The one scene of her touching the sand was nice, but I did cringe a little when she tore down Stannis' banner. Someone joked, How dare you stand where he once stood! My god, what I, what I would do for an epic scene between her and Stannis. But I do like that she goes around and takes a tour of Dragonstone. Someone had to. And that scene was silent. I did really enjoy that. We didn't need any words here, and they played it beautifully. I'm also glad they saved her for last. It was a good ending to a premiere episode. For this, Alyssa said, Danny never ceases to impress me. The dragons keep growing, and so do her balls of steel. Was this the first episode where Tyrion was in but didn't say a word? Because that would be hilarious. Yes, I believe this is the first episode in which Tyrion has appeared and did not say one word. And believe it or not, Alyssa, Peter Dinklage is making over $1 million per episode, and this has got to be the easiest amount of cash he has ever made. But you know what? I'm glad he didn't talk, and I'll tell you why. Thrones has always shined the best during the quiet moments. I remember being so relieved during the ending of Hard Home when the Night's King made the dead rise and Jon sailed away. I was so happy we didn't get some random asshole in the boat saying, That was close! So, I liked it. Nothing needed to be said. It ended perfectly. Jay Black says, Danny, soundtrack, 10 out of 10, agreed. Set pieces, 10 out of 10, agreed. Atmosphere, 10 out of 10, agreed. But nothing really happened. Have to give this a B-. See, I get where you're coming from. If you've been with the show since the beginning, this has been a long time coming. But I do agree with you on all your points, except for that nothing happened. She defiled Stannis' castle with her feet and her dirty, dirty Dothraki and Unsullied army and is now moving around this war room. That is something that many fans are cringing at. Personally, I still think that she should have landed at Storm's End, the Baratheon main castle, but this is symbolic. She is there because this is where the first Targaryen king landed when he took over the continent 300 years ago. So, it is something happening, but at the same time, I get it. But it's also the premiere episode, so we can give it a pass for that. I'd give it a B+. And last but not least, we get the North. Now, don't get me wrong, I did like the North in this episode because it did have everything I wanted. Northern politics, Peter Baelish, Tormund and Brienne, and even a bit of an argument between Sansa and Jon, and even a follow-up on the Car Stark and Umber houses. Perfect. 10 out of fucking 10 for a Stark premiere. But... Okay, have you guys ever heard of that meme of Michael Bay movies being the same every time? Like how every Michael Bay movie has a checklist of things he always puts in his movies? Like... Explosions, check. Hot girl in a seductive pose, check. Cool cars, check. Comedic sidekick, check. I feel like the northern scenes now have a checklist of things. 
White Walkers? Check. Leona Mormont being feisty? Check. Jon Snow being a cool, awesome guy? Check. Look, I'm not saying it annoyed me too much, but it's becoming apparent now. But that aside, the North was my favorite for many reasons. The Jon and Sansa dynamic was great, and I love how she called out Ned and Rob for being dumb. I also enjoyed their argument because I do side with the both of them. Sansa is right, we need to reward our allies, but at the same time, we need soldiers. I also really loved the aerial view of Winterfell. That was great, and you guys know how much of a sucker I am for castles. But I have to call out John for a minute here. You're giving the Wildlings East Watch by the Sea? I don't know, that does seem a bit douchey to give him a castle the Night King might hit first, but giving him a Night's Watch castle is also comically ironic. I love it. I love the whole North this episode, but let me see your thoughts. Over at Patreon, Tim says, So Bran is back. Will the wall come down because of it? This is due to the belief that Bran still has the Night King's mark on his arm that allowed them to invade last season in the Three-Eyed Raven's cave. It's very possible that the Night King could be tracking Bran's every movement because of that, and I do hope it'll come up later. However, I doubt Bran will nullify the wall's magic at this point, because we are getting so much foreshadowing from like the Sam scenes about how long the wall has stood, so this means that it'll definitely be coming down soon. How will it be coming down? That's still up in the air. Bew Chambers, by the way, I hope you said your name right, says, Sansa is so desperate for credit that she is asking Jon to waste time and men by rewarding houses that were sworn to the Starks to begin with and hunting down traitors. Sansa doesn't understand the gravity of what's coming. And that is the tragedy of it. Jon is preparing for the future while Sansa is living in the now. She feels it's best to worry about that later when it does come and keep our allies closer to us. But your argument is Stannis' argument. Why should I bribe you or reward you for the loyalty you should have had for me already? Because he's the new guy. Yeah, he's a Stark, but you know what? Boltons could have easily won and were a few men short because we decided to come to your aid, when we could have just sat back and prepared even more for winter. Sansa wanting to reward the houses loyal to the Stark cause is a way to show the Stark still takes care of its own. I get her logic and I get where you're coming from, but it's a difficult decision nonetheless. Not only that, but Jon doesn't get as much loyalty if you want to argue that point. He is only half a Stark, while Sansa is rightfully the queen over him. You say that Sansa desperately wants credit? Yeah, you would too if your letter helped win the North. Plus, Sansa is three times the Lady of Winterfell over him. She is, as far as anyone knows, the last living heir to Winterfell. She is the Lady of Winterfell by marriage from the previous Lord of Winterfell, and she won the North by bringing in her allies. And don't worry, man, you're not the only one giving Sansa hate, but I can't get on her case. I love Sophie Turner. She's my dream crush. But let me know what you guys think. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it. Really, I do. Overall, I thought the episode was a great premiere with some minor annoyances here and there, but it was much better than what we've gotten before. Also, guys, hopefully soon I can finally start live streaming with you all, and I'd like to even set up a hotline so you all can call in and talk with me live. But later on, I will be appearing with Phil the Issues Guy on his live stream, and on there you will be able to chat with me live through the phone. I may even bring in Preston with me as well. Also, podcast episode 4 will be on Preston's channel, so look forward to that. We will be discussing the most recent episode. But guys, once again, thank you so much for watching. Hit that like button if you enjoyed. Hit that subscribe button as well, and consider supporting my loser man bun on Patreon. I promise all your support will go towards maintaining how awful it looks on me. But once again, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Baba Booey.